Hello, and welcome to the MS for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10, Bible-believing Christian. And if you're a video watcher over on YouTube or Spotify or any of our other video platforms, you'll notice I'm still out of my regular um, kind of setup because we're still having some work done at our house. We're still working on our house ourselves, kind of inching along. So this will be the quote unquote studio from here on out until we finish that. And there's not a bunch of hammering and construction sounds going on in the background. Um, before we get started, I want to highlight our sponsor, Milk and Honey Jewelry. Such a cool concept for moms. If you're a breastfeeding or bottle feeding, formula feeding mom, and you want to remember that time with your baby with something that is truly unique and also absolutely beautiful, check out Milk and Honey dot jewelry. They also have DIY kits that you can order by December 15th to get them in time for Christmas. If you want a unique gift for yourself or a friend, I guess it's not a gift if you do it for yourself, but a unique keepsake for yourself or a friend. Uh, most of their designs are in both gold and silver, and it only takes five milliliters or about a teaspoon of breast milk or formula to fill up the little cells in the jewelry designs. I think my favorite is the honeycomb design, and I love that the breast milk, it doesn't look like it's milk. It looks like it's actually a beautiful stone inside the jewelry. You can use the code ABBY for 15% off of your order. All right, so last week we talked about the controversial topic of Santa, and I love that that has become such a hot button topic in the culture, but especially in the Christian sphere where it's to Santa or not to Santa. And last week, the goal, as always, was to approach it in light of what scripture has to say about our heart posture and what we choose to do or not to do in hopes of bringing glory to God and not to man. And when I teased that episode on social media and talked about the fact that I would be addressing that, I had a really interesting question from someone. So I wanted to go ahead and address that as we head into today's topic, which is kind of a follow-up to last week. So they said, if the Bible doesn't have anything to say about a particular topic, how can we approach it from a biblical perspective? Um, at my knee-jerk reaction was to say, really? Like, I mean, surely we don't think as Christians that we only talk about the things that are specifically addressed in scripture, period. So surely we are thinking that God's word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, which is a figurative statement in and of itself, to everything that we encounter, to whatever age and era that we live in, to whatever cultural norms are popular for our particular country um, or society. Surely this is how we see ourselves as Christians is in not trying to wedge cultural mores in and around our faith and our relationship with the Lord and instead see how our relationship with the Lord and our adherence to an understanding of and love of his word kind of undergirds and also overarches all of those societal things. So, or, or familial things or emotional things or interpersonal relationships, whatever situation we're talking about. But then I thought about it and I'm like, okay, this may be my assumption. This is definitely the hermeneutic in which I was trained growing up by my parents was to say, okay, what's the historical background here that we could view it through in understanding where people are coming from? But more importantly, what does scripture have to say um, what does that historical context mean in light of the culture in the Old Testament, but then also how it relates to the New Testament? Because the Bible is not, we, we have a tendency to compartmentalize, to chop up the Bible into two sections. The weird old one that we don't really understand that seems really far-fetched and the nice loving new one that we're a little more okay with. And I think that that's a very superficial understanding of scripture. And it may sound like, what does this have to do with Christmas or Santa or anything? But if we think that we have to look into scripture and find only those exact phrases which apply. So the Ten Commandments would be a really great example of that. Do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery, don't take the Lord's name in vain, honor the Sabbath. Like those are so concrete that we can latch onto those. And keep in mind, Jesus references those commandments. Like, for example, when he's talking to the rich young ruler and asks him about the commandments that he's kept, and the rich young ruler says, oh, all these I've kept since my youth. You know, what, what else am I supposed to do to be um, 
righteous and holy. And of course, Jesus requires more of him. He requires him to give his heart, not just his actions. And so for someone that's really kind of wanting a very um, straight arrow, didactic, prescriptive approach, the Old Testament may be really appealing for someone who's wanting to feel their faith. The New Testament may be more so, but the truth is they are married and there is an overarching theme of God's sovereignty, of his grace, of his redemption that runs throughout from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. So when we are talking about examining cultural things, when we are talking about examining belief systems, when we're talking about approaching who we marry, what we study, what we do for a living, how many children we have in light of scripture, we're not supposed to be proof texting. So proof texting is just a phrase that means I'm going to stab my finger at a verse in the Bible that has a word that has to do with the topic that I'm talking about and say, see, look, this says this particular thing, and therefore we can't or can do this. Instead, we're to look at scripture as a whole and say, what is consistent throughout the Bible in this area? So when we talked about Santa, for example, the Bible doesn't have anything to say about Santa. It doesn't mention St. Nicholas. He wasn't born when the Bible was written. Um, it doesn't talk about Christmas. That word is never used. So how do we approach Santa Claus? How do we approach Christmas traditions or practices in light of scripture? Well, we look at principles. We back way up and say, not is there a specific cherry picked proof text that makes my point, but leaves out the whole canon of scripture. Instead of that, we say, what are the principles? What are the ideas? What are the consistent truths that can be found in scripture that apply to this or any topic? So last week we talked about the idea that Santa Claus, while if a family chooses to approach that as a fun myth or a way of playing a game with their children can't or or introducing them to a historical figure can definitely be something that a God honoring Christian biblical family could approach as long as they're not making it an idol as long as that isn't the source of their um, joy at Christmas you know we talk about idols and you're like are you talking about a physical thing Abby are you talking about something made of silver and gold are we talking about an obsession with a particular topic like kind of nail that down for me again Jesus makes it very clear that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So where we're placing our money, where we're placing our hope, where we place our time and our focus and our thoughts, those all become idols when they take the place of our devotion to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if that's what's happening with Santa, then you probably have a creation versus the creator type of situation where you're worshiping created things rather than the creator. And that's exactly what I mean by approaching something from a biblical perspective, even if it's not specifically addressed in scripture. I really do believe that we can extrapolate principles to say, this is not a good fit, or this is veering into idolatry, or this is downright wrong. You know, we're not just going to call things maybe not a good idea or um, culturally kind of irrelevant or relevant. It, sometimes it is a black and white. This is wicked. This is wrong. We should run far from it. And the temptation is to water that down. And sometimes scripture is so crystal clear. And other times we have to use discernment. Other times it's going to depend on the dynamic of our families or the personality of the child. And before I, before I dive into today's topic as the follow-up to last week's, I want to give you a really good example of what I mean by it might depend on a child's personality. I have a really good friend who's a mom of nine who is about 16, 17 years my senior. She has grown children and her oldest is now grown and married and pregnant with her fourth, I believe, child. And so she has four little kids or is about to have her fourth. And I remember that Susan, my friend, talked about how they homeschooled and they did co-op and they hybrid schooled and they did different versions of things and they did their schooling based on their understanding of what that particular child needed for his academic growth, for his social situations 
And her oldest daughter, looking back, was like, Mom, I can't believe she was homeschooled all the way through. She said, I can't believe you let so-and-so, one of her younger siblings, go to high school at such-and-such school when I asked you if I could do that. And you said, I don't think that's a good fit for us. And her mom, who is a very straight shooter, told her, listen, it was not a good fit for us because you had not shown yourself to be responsible in that area to handle peer pressure well. And it was interesting because I think the mom has always been a straight shooter. Like this wouldn't have been a surprising answer for her daughter because she grew up with her. She knew that her mother spoke plain truth to her as well as kindness and goodness. Uh, my friend Susan is such a kind, kind person and is so good too and with her children and other people's children as well, honestly. Um, so I know that her oldest daughter was not surprised by the answer in many ways. But I love that her response was, as an adult, you know what, mom, you're right. I wouldn't have handled it well. So when I say that there is absolute truth and it is God's word, but when I also say that sometimes we have to take those principles and apply them with wisdom and discernment that we get from seeking the Lord's wisdom in our life, not man's wisdom, that sometimes it will mean that some kids go to a private school in high school because that's a better fit for them. And some kids stay home because they wouldn't handle the peer pressure well. Same thing with Santa Claus, same thing with some other situations where we have freedom in Christ, but we are still being called to be faithful to God's word and to say, what will work for our family that also glorifies God? So as I talk about some of the traditions that we do, as opposed to the one that we talked about last week that we've chosen not to do for our family dynamic, I want you to keep in mind what I always say, which is the goal here is not to do things how the Halberstadt family does them. And I would assume that that's not your goal either, but I know that certain personalities are like, man, I, I like what I'm hearing here as a general rule. Um, I like the biblical support. So maybe if they're doing it, I should do it. But instead, I want you to, I want to encourage you to take any ideas that I give you here about traditions that we love or outreaches that we do or ways of um, giving that we participate in to your husband and to the Lord first and say, is this a good fit for our family? Does this inspire kind of an idea of where I could go in the future? Is it exactly what I want to do? Is it sort of what I want to do? Or will it not work for us at all in this season or maybe ever? Because I think all of those are options. And some of the things that I'm going to suggest are great things to do in general. And you'll, you'll understand what I mean here in a minute and probably something every family should be doing, but maybe not in the specific way that we do it. So I get asked about Santa every year and we talked about that. And um, hopefully my explanation for how we're approaching that topic from a biblical perspective of applying principles rather than having to specifically find a proof text about Santa Claus in the Bible made sense. Um, and then I also get asked as a follow-up question, well, what do you do? Um, what ways do you make? Advent, a special time for your family. How do you bring the focus to Christ? How are you generous? What about Christmas is appealing to you and is a source of joy to you and your family and a source of outreach? So I'll answer those questions today with just some things that we've done through the year, some things that we have continued to do. Some of them will be utterly frivolous, personal preferences, and you may or may not resonate with them at all. Some of them I think will be more of the principal nature that you could put your own spin on. Um, so one thing that we like to do early in the Christmas season, really before it gets too crazy, most years, we actually did not do it this year, um, really more than anything because of my busyness level and the fact that I just was not on the Operation Christmas Child page in my brain to get everything turned in in time. But we usually make Operation Christmas Child boxes each year and each of our kids gets a box and they fill, fill it with um, fun goodies for children in another country. And they really, really enjoy that process of picking those out and writing notes and uh, picking whether they want, they want to have their gift given to a boy or a girl. As you can imagine, especially with the kids 12 and under, it's almost always if they're a girl, they want it to go to a girl. If they're a boy, they want it to go to a boy. So we have a lot of fun with that and we have for years. So that's, that's one suggestion for you to check out. Um, Another way that in approaching the Christmas season, we try to keep the focus on generosity, on the spirit of Christmas, quote unquote, being that Christ came to save those who are lost. Christ came to give of himself. And that's the model that we have. And 
is to sit down. We just did this the other day and chat about ways that we can be a blessing to others. Um, some things on our list this year are caroling at a retirement home or nursing home. Um, we usually do that at, at least one each year in some capacity or another. Last year, we did it with our small group. We've done it with our ballet group before, with our piano recitals. Um, fortunately, we have some friends that have helped facilitate that because they've chosen to do the piano recital or the ballet group at a retirement home so they can appreciate um, just the performances and getting to talk to young people and getting to have visitors. So that's one thing that we enjoy doing. Um, we also have, if you haven't heard the podcast on something that I do with some other mom friends of mine and their daughters called Grace Girls, I suggest and encourage you to listen to that. Um, and so we will do something usually with Grace Girls that's similar. We've gone to a nursing home or we've gone caroling in the neighborhood. And we like to partner with friends of ours and go we don't usually live in a neighborhood. We're in a neighborhood currently with our rental, but usually we kind of live in a, our, our actual house is in kind of a spaced out place where we can't walk on the road without, you know, with small children, without some serious danger of getting hit by a car coming around a curve. So we don't typically walk in that neighborhood, but we'll, we'll go to a friend's neighborhood and go caroling with them. Um, and I have some really musical kids and I have some not so musical kids, but you know, the Bible tells us to make a joyful noise. And so We'll go caroling, we'll have hot cocoa and cookies afterwards, and it's just a fun time of singing praises to the Lord, but also encouraging others. Another thing that our kids really enjoy doing is um, Samaritan's Purse, sometimes Compassion International, um, a couple of other ones that we've done before that are escaping my memory. We'll send out catalogs where you can pick as a family or allow your kids to pick as a family their own individual things. Items that are practically helpful to people that live in much more dire circumstances than we find ourselves in in the West. So typically it's going to be people in Africa or South America or another underprivileged country where they're needing a goat, they're needing a pig, they're needing a vehicle, they're needing or money donated toward the vehicle. Um, they're needing a chicken coop built or something that helps to contribute to their livelihoods, which they are eking out by the sweat of their brow. Um, and my kids don't have a really strong point of reference for that. We don't live on a homestead. Their meals are provided to them daily. Groceries appear magically when we pick them up from the grocery store and we put them away in our fridge. And so it's good for them to see that people around the world don't have all of these conveniences and don't, aren't, aren't as you know, able to access food and water, clean water. That's another thing you can um, contribute money toward having wells dug. And so that's, that's something that we really enjoy sitting down and looking through those catalogs and letting our kids pick. And we do that to some extent as part of our year in tithe. So we don't set a big limit on um, things that kids can pick. They haven't contributed monetarily necessarily to those things, um, at least not significantly, but they can use them as part of their tithing. And then we can use them as part of our end of year tithe to do sometimes larger items like um, the chicken coop or several animals that we can buy. So they really enjoy those, knowing that those are, are making a concrete difference in someone's life and their livelihood. I also have kids that love to bake. And so inevitably there are cookies being made. We love to take them to elderly neighbors that we have. I mean, they're not neighbor neighbors, but they're, um, you know, probably maybe an eighth of a mile up the road and we can just bike up there. The older kids can or hop in the car and go visit them. Um, so they love to bake cookies. They love to make treats. Uh, I remember very distinctly because again, we don't have a traditional neighborhood. There are houses fairly regularly on our road, but it is not a traditional walking neighborhood. So we came and introduced ourselves. I think at the time when we first moved to our house, we had seven kids. We went around and introduced ourselves to everyone. And it was interesting to see who opened the door and just looked utterly shocked by all these kids piling out of a van. Now we didn't like rush into their home or anything. I promise it wasn't that overwhelming, but some people were thrilled and some people were um, a little overwhelmed looking. So we just smiled, handed him a Christmas card, brought him some cookies, that kind of thing. And so of those people that we visited, of course, there have been the ones that have blossomed into genuine friendships 
It's going to be the truth. And every time you have an interaction with another human being, some are going to stick, some aren't. So for the ones that have stuck, we love to reach out to them and uh, bless them extra at Christmas. Um, the kids love to write cards and letters for our elderly neighbors, which can happen at any time. But I think it's a really great time of year to make sure that people feel seen. And I think it's an easy time of year for people who don't get a lot of visitors to feel particularly lonely. And so that's, that's a great way of reaching out. I always get uh, asked for resources about curricula for Christmas or for programs that we've used that we enjoy. And so I thought I would highlight three. And these are not ones that we do every year or that we spend a lot of time on, but these are three that I would recommend because I trust the source. Um, one for women would be Ruth Jo Simon's Advent devotional. It is completely, I think it's called a manual. Um, I was about to say it's completely escaping me what it's called, but I believe it's called a manual and it's beautiful and, um, little short sections, easy to read, easy to digest, great reminders. I'll put the link down in the show notes for that one. Um, another idea is the giving manger and it's where you basically have this little, little tiny manger that you fill with straw and each piece of straw that you place in the manger represents an act of kindness, goodwill, generosity towards others. So it's just kind of a way of your kids being able, especially your younger kids, being able to see their kindness and generosity that the, the, the Lord kind of stirs in their little hearts, literally piling up in the manger as you prepare for Jesus to come. So that's, that's a really sweet one. And then another really good resource is Treehouse Schoolhouse and her Christmas um, curricula for kids. She creates homeschool resources, but even if you don't homeschool, these are really great um, interactive ways of talking about the true meaning of Christmas. And I know that that's such a cliche, kind of cheesy sounding phrase, but the true meaning of Christmas is Christ's sacrifice for us and coming and taking on flesh as a tiny baby so that he could grow and minister on this earth, be fully God and fully human, and then die on the cross for our sins, sacrificing himself and taking the weight of the world's sin on his shoulders. And that starts in the manger. And so um, Treehouse Schoolhouse, my friend Lindsay does a really good job of sticking to that truth while engaging children. So I recommend her resource as well. Um, a couple of other ones that generally have just good, solid resources for kids are um, September and Co. They have great character resources. I haven't looked specifically to see if they have Advent resources, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do. And another one that I would just recommend in general um, that might have some Advent related resources, but also it's just a very solid source of theology for kids is called cross formed kids. And we will put the links to those in the show notes as well. Okay. So those are just some ideas. Again, I think that the principle is solid that we are to focus on others, focus on the joy of Jesus sacrifice for us and his generosity in loving us enough to come here and die for us. That's, that, that's the focus. Um, that that's where our hearts should be at Christmas. And that's why we celebrate it. But the different ways that you could celebrate that are just myriad. I mean, you could go so many different directions with that in God honoring ways. So that's one of those examples where I'm like, the principle is solid. We should focus on the Lord and we should focus on others. Love God, love others. But you could do it in so many different ways. So those are just some, just some suggestions of things that we do. Um, then we're just going to move on to the super frivolous stuff and I'll just run through some, some traditions that we really enjoy that have really nothing to do with, um, some great theological depth or meaning and are more just a way of bringing joy to our family and increasing camaraderie. Because I talked last week about the idea that, yo, know, if you don't do Santa, you're going to take all the magic out of Christmas. You're going to take all the fun out of Christmas. And I find that to be very much so not true. I find there are so many unique and creative ways to bring joy to the season and to celebrate with your family and to make those memories that will be touchstones core memories for your children for many years to come that have nothing to do with Santa that we have not, none of my kids have felt deprived. So if you're going that direction, I encourage you to be creative, to research and kind of pay attention to the heartbeat of your home and make what makes sense for you guys and then run with it. Um, we do 
Christmas jammies. You know, I know that's not unique at all. And I didn't do it for years. I resisted it for budget sake alone. I'm like, that's a lot of money to spend on just Christmas pajamas. And then of course my brain kicked in and I was like, wait a minute, if I'm going to buy my kids pajamas anyway, and they need pajamas, then we could buy them at Christmas. And I don't care if they wear them year round. That's a great investment. <laughs> they need them anyway. So I'll usually buy them from somewhere like Old Navy or even Walmart if they have some good ones. Um, when they have their Black Friday sales, you can get them for 50 or 75% off. Even well before the Christmas season, um, I usually find the best deals if you get them maybe a couple of months early. And so I'll, we'll do those. I give them out on Christmas Eve. I know a lot of people wear them all of December, and I guess we could do that. I think I just have Christmas Eve stuck in my head. We'll give them out on Christmas Eve, and we will wear those for Christmas Day. Everybody, Sean and I do it too, all the way down to the little boys. And everybody enjoys that. I mean, my teenagers like it too, so it's just a fun tradition, and they they expect it at this point. Um, we also pick names between siblings, So, and that's somewhat new for us. Because when our kids were really young and didn't have any money of their own, it was kind of like, you know, can I buy something? It's like, well, we can maybe do something small, but considering that mama and daddy are the ones actually buying it, maybe we're going to keep it to a minimum and let's make something for a sibling. Let's make a craft. Let's draw a picture. And I think those are great ways to save money and to stay within a budget for your kids and for yourself. Totally legitimate. However, our kids, quite a few of them have gotten to the stage where they have some allowance. And if you're wondering what chores they can do to get allowance, I have an entire episode on chore responsibilities, what we do for allowance, just kind of that whole concept. If you want to check that out, um, I'll put that episode in the show notes as well, because I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, so a lot of our kids have some money of their own and they want to buy gifts for siblings. So we've just gotten in the habit so that the ones that are really gift minded don't end up buying a gift for every single sibling and going bankrupt of drawing names between siblings. And yes, the little bitties draw names and have no clue what's going on and I buy for them, but you know, everybody gets a gift, one gift from the sibling group. We also do, because people are like, how in the world do you do Christmas for 10 kids? How do you know how to keep it even? So we do something you want, something you need, something to wear, something to read. Um, so the something you want, we don't have our kids make Christmas lists or go through and mark things in catalogs. I'm just paying attention to things that they've mentioned or in the something you need category, things that they need, if they need a new pair of shoes or if they need a new sports related item. So I'm, I'm just kind of trying to keep up by jotting notes on my phone. My husband does the same. And then, um, so the item that they want or maybe it might be several smaller items that add up to the equivalent of one other person's larger item. It fills that category. And then something you need is usually, like I said, shoes or something. But usually, honestly, it's not that big. Everybody needs toothbrushes and underwear when it comes to Christmas time. And so the, typically the something you need is a new toothbrush and some underwear. And no, I don't just buy one toothbrush a year. We replenish them as needed throughout the year, but I have started buying the older kids, the electric version, and then we just replace the heads as needed. So I guess they're not, they're actually not getting new, um, new toothbrushes, but they will get new toothbrush heads. Not exciting. We stick them in the stockings, but Hey, it's stuff that they need. And so we kind of, they know they're getting it. Um, we also do stockings and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the something to wear is usually a nicer item. So some Sunday clothes or um, some jeans that they need their jeans replaced or like I said, a nicer pair of shoes, something like that, that might not be, I mean, I buy a whole lot of my kids clothes from Walmart or clearance. And so they're not getting high end items ever really. But if I find something for sale on like J crew factory and they had their extra 60% off or something. I'll actually squirrel those items away in bags in my closet or under my bed and just keep in mind that I got something nice and cute for the girls or for the little boys or, or something, you know, like a nice hoodie for my teenagers who love to wear those. And then I'll pull that out at Christmas time if they haven't had a need for it before then. Um, and then something to read. I just throughout the year will find deals on books or, um, maybe Della is wanting the next series of Betsy, Tacey and Tib, 
or um, Anna Avery Gable's book, or um, Thea wanted more Hank the Cowdog books, or I might buy us for our homeschool set some more Christian heroes than a now, which is fantastic series that I've mentioned before. But if you don't have those, highly, highly recommend getting several of those sets. They are captivating for my kids. They love those, those books. And I love them too. Um, and then we also do stockings. So those are just going to be treats. Um, you know, I'll get them Burt's Bees, lip balms or gum or candy or, um, just some other little this and that's like, I got my girls, um, little, what are those called? Little, uh, it's not a toiletry set. It's like a manicure set. So it has tweezers and cuticle cutters and, um, or the thing that pushes back orange sticks or whatever the thing that pushes your cuticles back. I'm going to get a message from somebody saying, don't let your girls cut their own cuticles. It's not a cuticle cutter. Um, fingernail clippers just in a cute little, cute little container that they can put in their purse and they will go crazy for them or claw clips for their hair or, um, you know, just, I think you can fill your own stockings, but that's the kind of thing that we put in there. It's, it's kind of a combination of practical and cute and fun and things they enjoy and yummy things to eat. Um, and we always do stockings first on Christmas morning. And then I have uh, amassed, I make that sound like it's a huge collection, but I have a collection of vintage thrifted dishes that are Christmas themed. They are, either have snowflakes on them or funny little um, reindeer scenes or whatever, holly. It's kind of a very mix matched um, mishmash, <laughs> say that, say that three times fast, of dishes for Christmas. And we'll use those for Christmas breakfast. And Christmas breakfast for years now has been stuffed French toast, where we make this cream cheese and raspberry filling and put it together between brioche bread and batter it up, grill it up and sprinkle it with powdered sugar. It's like sugar upon sugar upon sugar. And it's so decadent and so yummy. And we'll usually have that with some bacon for breakfast, maybe some eggs. Um, so we do stockings first, then we do Christmas morning breakfast. Then we read the Christmas story from Luke two. Then we will open presents and just chill for the whole day. And we do Christmas together as a family, as mom, dad, 10 kids. And then we'll have different celebrations with his side of the family or my side of the family on different days. But usually I can't think of an exception to that. Anytime recently we have actually done Christmas day together as a family and our kids love it and they don't want to go anywhere. They want to stay in their Christmas jammies all day long and they want to um, hang out together as a family, which is what I love as well. We also have a fun tradition before we ever get to Christmas day of um, doing gingerbread houses with family and friends. We usually have my brother and sister-in-law and their four little girls come and my best friend Lindsay and her three kids and husband come. And we actually don't make gingerbread houses though. Uh, so at our actual house, we had a 12 foot by five foot island, which was at the absolute hub of the kitchen. We did, you know, 90% of our gathering there. We eat our breakfast there. We eat our lunch there. We eat our dinner there. We hardly ever use our dining room table, which is only like maybe 15 feet away. Um, and so we cover that table with graham crackers. We mix up some royal icing, which you can just Google royal icing. And it's super easy to make. And it dries like concrete and holds your, uh, probably could chip a tooth, hold your house together. And so we mix up a ton of icing. We buy a ton of graham crackers and then we have this contest. There's no, I mean, we probably should do official prizes now that we have older kids who are capable of kind of creating masterpieces and there's just candy everywhere. And, um, again, it's, it's a, it's a dental visit waiting to happen for sure. But the kids absolutely love it. We've done that pretty much every year. I think we had to skip one year when just people were sick and nobody could come recently, but for the most part, every year for years now, probably seven years, and the kids really look forward to that. We have hot chocolate. Oh, wassail. We have wassail. So if you don't know what wassail is, it's spelled W-A-S-S-A-I-L. I'm assuming you do. But if you don't, do yourself a favor and look up a wassail recipe because it is absolutely delicious. So that and then another thing that my best friend, Lindsay, that comes to our gingerbread or graham cracker bread house night and I do is we go on a morning very close to Christmas. Um, sometimes it's Christmas Eve morning, it's usually between the 20th and the 24th. And we will get up really early 
and we will go to whatever restaurant is open at like 5.30 or 6 in the morning, have some breakfast, and then we will go to a store and stocking stuffer shop. And we'll spend about two or three hours together in the, that morning. Um, it's just fun. I mean, it's just we're up in the middle of the night, it feels like. There's no Christmas traffic anywhere, and we get our shopping done before the crowds come out and get to hang out together. So highly recommend that as a tradition because we've been doing that for years as well. I'm sure there's more that I am missing. Um, but again, when the goal is not to do exactly what we do, but instead to just kind of get the creative juices flowing and give you an idea of lots and lots of ways that you can make Christmas a time of memories and consistent traditions for your family and joy because here's the thing. Someone's going to tell me, well, none of those things have to do with Jesus. So how are you teaching your kids about Jesus? We are told in the Bible that God rejoices over us with singing. We are told to taste and see that the Lord is good. We are told to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. We are told to make a joyful noise. We are told to sing to the Lord. We are told this idea of... Um, giving thanks in so many different ways and in so many different books in the Bible. And I feel like one of the ways that we can impress the truth of all of that on our kids is by showing them that we serve a God who enjoys us. We serve a God who loves us. We serve a God who does not begrudge us good and yummy things. We serve a God who can be glorified in our um, kindness to each other, in our celebrating his goodness with each other. And so even if we're not specifically quoting Bible verses to each other or caroling while we're doing the gingerbread houses, although usually we do have carols playing in the background, or, or whatever it is that kind of makes the sacred holy in, in a specific way, we can still honor God in everything that we say and do. So that's the focus. That's the goal. And I hope you're encouraged this Christmas season to make memories with your family, to seek out joy wherever you can find it, and to bring glory to God in every way that you celebrate Christmas, either big or small. If you enjoyed the Emmys for Mama podcast, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and follow along, maybe share with friends or even leave a review. And if you want more content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, be sure to follow along on Instagram at m.is.or.mama.